Ecology of Everyday Life, Rethinking the Desire for Nature, by Kaya Heller, published by Black Rose Books, 1999. Part 1, The Desire for Nature Chapter 1 Rescuing Lady Nature, Ecology and the Cult of the Romantic Ecological awareness of the planet peaked in 1972 when astronauts first photographed the planet, revealing thick furrows of smog encasing a blue and green ball. The world is dying, became the common cry as the planet, personified as Mother Earth, captured national, sentimental attention. Nature became rendered as a victimized woman, a Madonna-like angel to be idealized, protected and saved from society's inability to restrain itself. Decades later, we still witness popular expressions of the desire to protect nature. As we observe each April on Earth Day, politicians, corporate agents and environmentalists take their annual leap into the romantic, ecological drama, becoming Econites ready to save helpless lady nature from the dragon of human irresponsibility. The cult of romantic love, which emerged first in the 12th century poetry of the French troubadours of Languedoc still provides a cauldron of images and metaphors for today's depictions of nature. Note. Denis de Rougemont, Love in the Western World, Princeton, Princeton University Press, 1983, pages 1067. End note. Contemporary Western representations of Mother Nature emerged out of this cult of the Romantic tradition based on a dialectic between an heroic savior and an ideal lover. Indeed. The metaphors and myths used to discuss ecological problems often find their origins within romantic literature. Yet despite its association with love, romanticism often shows its cool side when it surfaces within ecological discourse. While often expressing a desire to protect Mother Nature, it may ignore the social and political struggles of marginalized peoples. In particular, Romantic ecology fails to challenge the ideologies and institutions of social domination that legitimize social injustice. Instead of challenging institutions and ideologies of domination within society in general, romantic ecology too often points its sword toward abstract dragons such as human nature, technology, or Western civilization, all of which are held responsible for slaying lady nature. In turn, Romantic ecology often veils a theme of animosity toward marginalized groups under a silk cloak of idealism, protection, and a promise of self-constraint. It not only refuses to make social liberation a priority, but in some cases, actually holds the oppressed responsible for the destruction of the natural world. Before exploring the romanticization of nature, we might look briefly at the romanticization of women in the Middle Ages as depicted in romantic love poetry. Unlike modern romance which consists of moonlit dinners, crimson sunsets, and sexual contact, medieval romanticism represents an unconsummated love. As in the story of Tristan and Isolde, an Arthurian romance in which two ill-fated young lovers spend their short lives in pursuit of an unconsummated, yet passionate love, lovers rarely express their desire for each other physically. Note. Roger Sherman Loomis Translation The Romance of Tristan and Assault by Thomas of Britain. New York, Boyer Books, 1931. End note. Instead, classical romance emphasizes the act of passionate longing, an intensity of feeling that is heightened by deprivation. Knightly and courtly romance is a love from afar, expressing its desire in the form of passionate love poetry. The origins of romantic love may be traced to Plato's concept of desire. Note. Ebedum, p. 64. End note. Platonic love emerges out of metaphysical dualism which divides the world into two discrete material and spiritual domains. The realm of spirit, or idea, is regarded as superior to the transient and perishable realm of the body or matter. According to Plato, intellectual and sexual knowledge is most valuable when gleaned independent of physical experience for ideal love represents a disembodied yearning that remains unpolluted by physical contact. For Plato, the highest form of love is the intellectual fondling of eternal, rational ideas found in geometry philosophy and logic. For the romantic, ideal love is the exercise of sexual restraint and an intellectual expression of passion through love poetry. Idealization, protection, and constraint. 
romantic poetry often consists of the wistful desire of a man for an idealized woman to whom he rarely gains sexual access. This noblest desire thrives in a realm of purity in contrast to marriage, which is seen as merely reproductive. Courtly romance consists of elaborate rituals of devotion in which the lover promises to protect the beloved from human and mythical villains, while also promising to restrain his sexual desire for the beloved lady. However, the lover's inauthentic idealization of his beloved is reflected in the incongruity between the celebratory spirit of the poetry and the actual social context in which it was written. Certainly the idealized, pedestaled position of the women in the poetry does not reflect the actual status of the majority of women in feudal society. The theme of romantic protection represents a fantastical projection by the male romantic. Even when the lady's lack of social power seeps through into the fabric of the poetry, her powerlessness is framed as a need for knightly protection. The romantic fantasizes that the woman needs knightly protection from predators instead of recognizing her desire for social potency. The simultaneous act of elevating and protecting the idealized woman in romanticism allows the hero to sustain the fantasy of the woman on pedestal while indirectly acknowledging her very real low social status. In this way, the romantic becomes the protector of the pedestaled woman, creating a subtle amalgamation of male fantasy and social reality. The fantasy of romantic protection is predicated on the lover's promise of sexual self-constraint toward his lady. However, romanticism never questions the social conditions which make such constraint necessary. A romantic story would lose its charm if the knight were to challenge the social or political institutions which render the lady powerless in the first place. Romanticism patently accepts that men inherently desire to plunder women, while regarding promises of male self-control as heroic acts of self-mastery. At this juncture, we might ask why the romantic fails to critique the social conditions which regard idealization, protection, and male self-constraint as a necessary good? Surely the lover wishes his beloved to be truly free. Perhaps the function of romantic love is to camouflage the lover's complicity in perpetuating the domination of the beloved. Perhaps idealizing, protecting, and promising to constrain the desire to defile the beloved emerges out of a power structure from which the lover knowingly or unknowingly benefits and thus wishes to maintain. In the name of protecting the beloved from the dragon that threatens to slay her, then, the knight actually slays his beloved himself he slays his lady's self-determination and agency in the world. In this way, the knight is really the dragon in drag. Romance, Hierarchy, and Alienated Desire In addition to prescribing idealization, protection, and self-constraint, romanticism also prescribes an alienated form of desire and knowledge. Romantic love is based on the lover's desires rather than on an authentic knowledge of the beloved. The romantic's love depends on his fantasy of his beloved as inherently powerless and good according to his definition. He views his beloved through a narrow lens, focusing only on a minute vulnerable section of her full identity, meanwhile the rest of her body becomes a screen for the projection of his fantasy of the ideal woman. The romantic glosses over information about his beloved which contradicts his personal yearnings. In this way, romantic love is a form of reductionism reducing the idea of woman from a full range of human potential to a tiny list of male desires. Romanticism is a way of knowing which is wedded to ignorance. The romantic clearly does not know his lady to be a woman capable of self-determination and resistance. He does not recognize her ability to express what is most human, including her capacity for rationality and critical self-consciousness. Most significantly the romantic is unaware of women's capacity for self-assertion through sabotage and resistance. Note. For a discussion of the relationship between sabotage and agency see Sarah Lucia Hoagland, Lesbian Ethics, Toward New Value, Palo Alto, Institute for Lesbian Studies, 1988. Pages 46-49. End note. The subject of romantic poetry rarely includes stories of good women poisoning their romantic lovers' food, or stories of admirable women being emotionally unavailable to their lovers. Few are the poems or stories which tell of strong, lovable women resisting compulsory motherhood, marriage, and yes, even heterosexual romance. The cult of the romantic erases the idea that woman can be a wrench in the machine of male domination.
Romantic love represents an attempt to love and know another from behind a wall of domination. Indeed, true love and understanding can only occur when both subjects are free to express their own desires. The knight can only love the lady if he is willing to relinquish his power over her, supporting her struggle if and when she requests it, then and only then, can they begin to talk about love. Romantic desire is predicated on a hierarchical separation between the lover and the beloved, separations that are, in turn, predicated on hierarchies based on such factors as sex, age, race, and class. Traditionally just as the master may romanticize the slave, men may romanticize women, adults may romanticize children, and the rich may romanticize the poor. These separations are reinforced by institutions and ideologies that exaggerate differences between identity groups within social hierarchies. In turn, while the idea of gender is polarized and performed through rigid gender roles and children are segregated in school ghettos, adults are ghettoized in workplaces often segregated by race, class, and sex. These structural barriers facilitate the condition of social alienation based on ignorance. Romantic desire flourishes between the walls of social hierarchy as the privileged paint their own romantic fantasies of the lives and condition of the oppressed. When all is said and done, the privileged know very little about the history and lives of those upon whose backs their privilege weighs. Contemporary Ecology and the Romantic Protection of Nature Today society's increasingly alienated understanding of nature opens the way for romantic discussions of ecology. More and more, the nature we know is a romantic presentation of an exaggerated hypernature marketing researchers believe we would be likely to buy. The less we know about rural life, for instance the more we desire it. Ideas of nature, a blend of notions of exotic wilderness and country living, form a repository for dreams of a desirable quality of life. So many of us long wistfully for a life we have never lived but hope to find someday on vacation at a Disney-fied jungle safari or glittering sweetly inside a bottle of Vermont-made maple syrup. Murray Bookchin, creator of the theory of social ecology said years ago that the more the rural dissolves into poverty development, and agribusiness, the more we would see romantic images of the rural in the media. Note. Murray Bookchin, Personal Communication July 18, 1984. End note. Sure enough, in the 1980s, just as the family farm crisis peaked, commercials and magazine ads were suddenly riddled with rural images, grandfathers were everywhere, rocking on rustic porches, uttering wise platitudes regarding the goodness of oat bran. Red-cheeked kids began running down dirt roads after a day of hard wholesome play in the country ready for stovetop stuffing. And just as the Vermont family dairy farm began to vanish in the early 80s, Ben and Jerry bought the rights to the Woody Jackson cow graphic, transforming the Holstein cow logo into the sacred calf of Vermont. The tendency to idealize nature is often accompanied by the desire to protect a nature that is portrayed as weak and vulnerable. Each year on Earth Day, an epidemic of t-shirts hits the stores depicting sentimental images of nature. One shirt in particular presents an image of a white man's hands cradling a soft bluish ball of earth. Huddled around the protective hands, stands a lovable crowd of characteristically white-eyed, long-lashed, feminine-looking deer, seals, and birds. Under the picture, written in a childlike scrawl, reads the caption, Love your mother. The message is clear, nature is ideal, chaste, and helpless as a baby girl. We must save her from the dragon of every man. Ironically this romantic posture toward nature often promotes an uncompassionate portrayal of the causes of nature's woes. The desire to protect nature often conceals the underlying desire to control and denigrate marginalized peoples. For example during the late 1980s, members of several radical ecology groups were called to task for attributing environmental problems to overpopulation and immigration. The Earth First Journal has consistently over the years advertised a sticker that reads Love your mother, don't become one. Paradoxically the same radical ecologists who express a romantic desire for Mother Earth, also suggest that mothers themselves are to blame for the denigration of nature. In the name of protecting Mother Earth, third world women are reduced to masses of faceless bodies devouring the scarce resources of the world. Meanwhile Gaia, the idealized mother herself, 
sits elevated on her galactic pedestal awaiting nightly protection from women's insatiable wombs. The fantasy of romantic protection blends perceptions of social reality with desire and fantasy. The romantic can remain disdainful and ignorant of systems of social oppression while pursuing the desire to protect Mother Nature. However, removing the veil of romantic protection from population debates reveals population imbalances to be the result of a continuing legacy of patriarchy colonialism, racism, and capitalism. For centuries, while suppressing indigenous cultural practices that regulate fertility social and political forces have created economic and cultural demands for increased fertility. Throughout history, small-scale cultures have been able to control population through a range of medicinal, technical, and sexual practices ranging from postnatal sexual taboos to herbal abortifacants. Note there have been a number of truly intelligent discussions of reproduction issues by feminists such as Betsy Hartman that address social and political considerations. See Betsy Hartman, Reproductive Rights and Wrongs, The Global Politics of Population Control and Reproductive Choice, New York, Harper and Row, 1987. End note. However, as capitalist wage economies emerged throughout Europe and the now Third World, Factors of poverty high infant mortality and religious reproductive control unsettled cultural practices that balance reproduction. Indeed, factors including lack of reproductive health care, colonially induced religious taboos against contraception, high infant mortality poverty and families, needs for child labor within cash economies create a context in which women bear more children than they historically would have otherwise. Moreover, Population fetishists rarely highlight the fact that overpopulation in the third world contributes little to the overall depletion of the Earth's resources. While one middle class person in the U.S. consumes 300 times the food and energy mass of one third world person, first world corporations and the U.S. military are the biggest resource consumers and polluters. In 1992, with less than 5% of the world's population, the U.S. consumes 25% of the world's commercial energy. Note. World Bank. 1993, World Development Report 1993. New York, Oxford University Press. End note. As Bookchin stated as early as 1969, there is something disturbing about the fact that population growth is given the primacy in the ecological crisis by a nation which has a fraction of the world's population and wastefully destroy more than 50% of the world's resources. Note. Murray Bookchin, The Power to Create the Power to Destroy and Toward an Ecological Society, Montreal, Black Rose Books, 1980, p. 37. End note. Consistently those who consume the most are held the least accountable while the poorest are blamed for the world's problems. Meanwhile the real corporate and state perpetrators of ecocide remain hidden under a shroud of innocence. Statistical numbers games that calculate national resource consumption to include a woman on welfare as well as that of General Motors, or people of color as well as whites, create an illusion of a generically human consumer. Such games serve to focus on numbers and demographics rather than social relationships and institutions such as capitalism. Deep ecologists such as Bill Daval and George Sessions have also often failed to address the social conditions of poor women. While their writings express a desire to protect nature, their romantic approach to ecological problems often entails a less than compassionate analysis of the origins of and solutions to the denigration of nature, quote. Humans are valued more highly individually and collectively than is the endangered species. Excessive human intervention in natural process has led other species to near extinction. For deep ecologists, the balance has long been tipped in favor of humans. Now we must shift the balance back to protect the habitat of other species. Protection of wilderness is imperative. End quote. Note. Bill Daval and George Sessions why Wilderness in the Nuclear Age, in Deep Ecology, Living as if Nature Mattered, Salt Lake City, Peregrine Smith Books, 1985, p. 127. End note. A careful analysis of this quote reveals the sexism and racism which often underlies a desire to protect nature. Constructing an unmediated category of humanity, 
these writers hold an abstract human responsible for the destruction of nature. However, it is unclear just whom is subsumed under this category of human. Do the authors refer to disenfranchised peoples who, rather than participating intentionally and profitably in human intervention over nature, are degraded along with natural processes themselves? Blaming humanity for nature's woes blames the human victims as well as perpetrators of the ecological crisis. Certainly those most victimized by capitalist processes are not to blame for ecological destruction. For example due to structural adjustment programs, laborers in so-called third world countries are coerced by multinational conglomerates and international development agencies to become instruments of ecological destruction. In the attempt to repay debt to the World Bank, local communities throughout the third world are forced to convert land areas to cash cropping sites destroying ecosystems that have sustained them for centuries. Note. For a good discussion of structural adjustment programs, see Bruce Rich, Mortgaging the Earth, the World Bank, Environment, Impoverishment and the Crisis of Development. Boston, Beacon Press, 1994. End note. Poor workers in both the first and third worlds fight daily to survive the low-pay slavery which subjects them to toxic and deadening working conditions, yet they too, are subsumed under the general category of the accountable human. Failing to expose the social hierarchies within the category of human erases the dignity and struggle of those who are reduced to and degraded along with nature. But again, the liberation struggles of marginalized peoples are never quite so romantic as the plight of the ecological activists struggling to protect nature. Ecology and the Desire for Purity Romantic ecology is often predicated, on the desire for purity. This desire carries within it a yearning to destroy all that is corrupt within society as well as that which threatens the integrity of nature. Choosing their own dragon of choice to bear the blame for ecological corruption, each yearns for a romanticized time, place, and people of the past whom they deem as having been idyllic. For some, it is the foreigner who destroys the integrity of a race, morality, or culture that the romantic craves so bitterly. For others the dragon is identified as modernity whose technologies, cities, and progressive ideas degrade a past social order that is romanticized as having been morally and ecologically superior. What purists share in common though, is a love for simplicity and simple ideas, if the cause of social evil is impurity, then the solution is the removal of the offending substance or subject. Romantic ecologists also have the tautological argument of natural law on their side. If nature is pure, then it is lawful and natural that such purity shall pervade. Why should there be population control? To protect the natural limit of resources of the planet. It is only natural that there should be so many people on the planet. Ecology is the perfect environment for the cultivation of a purist critique of modernity. Its green pastures provide free reign for the unbridled advance of a theory which provides both moral and scientistic ground for a critique of both modern and postmodern society. Note. For an in-depth discussion of the historical relationship between ecological discourse and reactionary thinking, particularly within the German context, See Janet Beale and Peter Stoudenmeyer, Ecofascism. London, AK Press 1995. End note. Within the green expanses of ecology the wild imagination of the nature romantic can run free with the certainty that what was old was not only good, but most importantly it was natural. The longing for an ecologically pure society reflects the desire to return to a time and place when society was free from the decadence associated with urban life. There is a distinctly rural bias within ecological discourse a depiction of the rural landscape as a vestige of past golden age of ecological purity and morality. Since the emergence of capitalism and the arrival of the urban capitalist center, the gap which opened between a world that had been largely agrarian and an increasingly urban society provided a space for the purists' romantic reverie. Often a bourgeois urbanite and rarely directly engaged in agricultural work, the nature romantic wrote about the abstract goodness of a rural life of the past, longing for an end to modernization and urbanization. However, the story of the town and country divide is hardly one of good and evil, while the country has not always constituted a realm of innocence, the city has not always been such a bad thing. As Raymond Williams points out in the case of Britain, 
the real histories of the country way of life and city life are astonishingly varied and uneven. Note. Raymond Williams, The Country and the City, New York, Oxford University Press, pp. 35 and note. While the rural village is often associated with ecological well-being and social cohesiveness, there exists a less liberatory association with the rural village that is not commonly discussed within contemporary ecological discussions. Note. For more on the dialectics of town and country see Murray Bookchin, Urbanization Without Cities, The Rise and Decline of Citizenship, Montreal, Black Rose Books, 1992. End note. The parochial tendency of rural life has often been a source of alienation for the stranger as well for those viewed as strange within the village itself. Women, gender benders, those with a vision that extends beyond the scope of the close-knit community have often been suppressed by the homogenizing tendency of small village life. Standing in sharp contrast to the harmonious and wholesome portrayals of country life are such parochial European rural disasters as the Spanish Inquisition, European witch burning, Eastern European pogroms, and U.S. plantation slavery atrocities that often took place within pastoral, natural rural contexts. In turn, while much contemporary ecological discussion portrays the city as a center of industry pollution, and social alienation, it has also represented a haven of social freedom. Out of the broken ties to family and village, came as well the opportunity to encounter new ideas and liberties. It is within cities that many social movements have emerged over the centuries, providing a refuge for those who were not always accepted within parochial rural villages such as Jews, Gypsies, intellectuals, secularists, anarchists, artists, and sexual nonconformists. While rural life undeniably offers the potential for close community ties and a closer tie to the land, it can also prove hospitable to xenophobia, social conformity, and parochialism. Despite the heterogeneity of categories of city and country, there still exists a strong rural bias within ecological discourse. For example a generic description of ecotopia is primarily located within a rural environment. The inhabitants of that imagined ecotopia are usually wholesome, able-bodied, white, and heterosexual. These taken-for-granted associations latent within popular consciousness are often shared particularly by European descendants raised within industrialized capitalist societies that define nature in opposition to society and the evil town in opposition to the wholesome country. Rarely would one imagine the ecological subject to be a Puerto Rican lesbian in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, a poor disabled man of color in Chicago, or a Jew in Brooklyn for ecology is primarily defined in opposition to the urban subject. The predominantly urban identity of such progressive movements such as feminism, lesbian and gay liberation, civil rights, and labor movements, renders feminists, queers, Jews, people of color, and urban workers as incongruent with white middle-class wholesome understandings of ecology. Implicit within the rural bias which marks much ecological discussion, is a reactionary nostalgia for the goodness of the simple life of the past. Today the old guy on the Quaker's oatmeal commercial suggests that living simply is the right thing to do. An Emersonian nature romanticism wafts through the air, informing us that all we need is a simple house a good book, and a chestnut or two to roast on the fire. It is time, we are told, to end our years of debauchery, time to buckle down. The family is re-romanticized as in the 50s, babies are in and family values must be restored. This romantic rurally biased conservationism smacks of political conservatism. A recent ad put out by Geo says, in the future, more people will lead simpler lives protect the environment, rediscover romance, and get to know Geo. The full-page ad presents a black and white photograph of a hometown-looking teenage boy and girl relaxing wholesomely in a convertible. The girl sports a fountain of long blonde flowing hair, her face clear of makeup, and reclines with the boy wearing clothing lifted directly from the late 50s, a time when the country was still innocent. The ad suggests that it would be desirable to restore the simplicity of the days before the Vietnam War, the civil rights and women's movements. Romance, which the women's movement is blamed for destroying by challenging gender roles, will be restored as well. 
Environmental campaigns increasingly conflate the decadence of today's neoliberal capitalism with yesterday's new left, citing the latter as the cause of social and ecological breakdown. However, there is nothing romantic about living simply. Women and the poor have lived the real simple life for centuries, impoverished by economic and social institutions of compulsory heterosexuality and alienated labor. A life without choices, alternatives, and in many cases, material subsistence, is indeed very simple. Our world is becoming increasingly culturally impoverished and simplified, filled with senseless commodities and spectacles. Women and all marginalized peoples, at the center of this quality crisis, cannot afford to live any more simply. And because so many have lived simply, restrained by authorities for centuries, the romantic appeal to conserve nature sounds seductively familiar, so familiar that many accept such admonitions without even thinking. However, upon closer look, we see that we are being implored not to release human potential for social and political transformation within society but instead, to conserve nature. Consumer Ecology the romance of ecological self-constraint. The desire for a pure, simple social world has claimed a new theater within contemporary society this time wearing the mask of the ecological consumer. Within this contemporary play, the well-meaning purist yearns to slay a new dragon, the impure product. For those who feel demoralized and poisoned by social and ecological degradation, Consumer ecology offers a way to combat the dragon of ecocide while purifying the body and soul at the same time, all without destabilizing institutions such as the state, capitalism, or racism. The search for an ecological lifestyle reflects the longing to establish congruence between consumption practices of everyday life and ecological ideals. Consumer ecology expresses a scientific dimension of ecology dictating methods of environmental and physical hygiene loaded with moral and spiritual meaning. Practices such as recycling, energy conservation, veganism, vegetarianism, or consuming organic products, are considered not only physically and environmentally more healthful, but resonate with the moral desires to be pure of spirit as well. Consumer ecology is a discrete private practice articulated within the dialogue between private industry and the private domestic sphere, a private response to the popular observation that both these spheres have been degraded and must be purged. Consumer ecology is a postmodern brand of asceticism based on romantic values of idealization, protection, and constraint. Promoting an idealized commodity that is chemical and waste-free, Consumer ecology encourages the never-ending search for the pure commodity that contains as much pure nature as possible while making the least impact on the natural world. In turn, the preoccupation with protection is deeply embedded in the world of commodity purity as well. Eco-consumers and green capitalists alike express their value of self-constraint by exercising self-control in the production and consumption of impure commodities. Upholding this impulse is the belief that down deep we are all greedy consumers who must restrain the desire to overconsume. Just as the courtly troubadour demonstrates desire for his lady by promising sexual self-constraint, individuals in society are encouraged to express their desire for nature by promising to constrain their inclination to spoil and deplete the environment. The impulse toward romantic self-constraint assumes a variety of forms ranging from self-restraint regarding consumption to reproductive restraint. At the more benign end of the spectrum, corporations appeal to individuals to restrain their everyday appetites for natural resources. Advertisers often deploy emotionally laden images of nature in their attempt to evoke in individuals a sense of shame and accountability for the destruction of the natural world. For example a few years ago, a TV campaign by Pepsi depicted a sentimental image of baby ducks swimming in a reedy pond with small children playing in the sand nearby. The caption read in pink script, Preserve it, they deserve it. Through the use of soft lenses and young children, Pepsi effectively associated the idea of nature preservation with an underlying injunction against defiling innocent children. The Environmental Defense Fund had a recent TV commercial in which the camera zoomed in upon the hands of a white man crumpling a whole earth photograph. As the earth's image was reduced to a tight paper ball, a stern voice announced dryly, If you don't recycle you're throwing it all away. In both instances, the message was clear, 
if individuals fail to constrain their desire to trash nature, the natural world is done for. Green Capital participates in the cult of romantic consumption, promoting collective self-constraint on the part of consumers. Stonyfield Farm for instance, recently launched a campaign called Planet Protectors which makes a romantic plea to children to change their own unchivalrous ways as well as those their parents. Planet Protectors mascot is a cartoon cow soaring through the air like Superman, Cape, and all, ready to save planet Earth. The theme is clear, by reusing Stonyfield Farms plastic yogurt containers, we all can protect the planet from harm. In their quarterly moose letter they ask their young readers, are you a planet protector? Are you committed to taking action to protect and restore the Earth? Do you act in ways that protect Earth from harm and heal damage already done? Note. Earth First bumper sticker is advertised in their catalog. End note. After providing information regarding the status of tropical rainforests, whose living things, they report, include only plants and animals, no mention of people, they explain tropical rainforests are rapidly disappearing due to logging and other development. As for the solutions to these problems, Stonyfield Farm encourages children to make a difference by choosing to use public transportation, carpool, walk, and don't leave lights on when you're not using them. Finally the children are warned every time you flick on a light or go for a ride in the car, CO2 is released into the atmosphere from the coal, oil, or gas burn to make energy. Be a planet protector. Note. Stonyfield Farm Planet Protectors Earth Action Moose Letter Winter 1997 End note On the surface, Stonyfield's message seems reasonable enough, we should each do our part to save the planet. However, it is what is left out of the message that is deeply troubling. First, by failing to discuss the human suffering of peoples living within the natures they represent, they separate the ecological from the social blaming the entire society for ecological harm. Second, Stonyfield individualizes the problem by making no mention of institutional causes of ecological degradation such as capitalism, government, the World Trade Organization, or the military-industrial complex, responsible for an overwhelming majority of pollution and resource extraction. Children are led to believe that by failing to restrain their individual hungers for car travel and electricity, they are as responsible for causing and solving ecological problems as are those unidentified institutions responsible for logging and other development. In the more extreme wing of the ecology movement, individuals are warned to restrain not only consumption practices, but sexual reproduction practices as well. In such discussions, the mere presence of humanity itself, resulting from an unrestrained fertility, is cited as the cause of ecological injustice. According to the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement, VHEM, individuals should express a love of nature by endorsing voluntary childlessness. On their home page on the web, the VHEM presents a series of brief question and answers about the movement presented in a light and jocular style that explains their philosophy. According to Lay Unite, the movement's spokes organism, the human experiment has run its course, quote, the hopeful alternative to the extinction of millions, probably billions, of species of plants and animals is the voluntary extinction of one species, Homo sapiens, us. Each time another one of us decides to not add another one of us to the burgeoning billions already squatting on this ravaged planet, another ray of hope shines through the gloom. When every human chooses to stop breeding, Earth will be allowed to return to its former glory, and all creatures will be free to live die, evolve, if they believe in evolution, and will perhaps pass away as so many of Mother Nature's experiments have done throughout the eons. Good health will be restored to Earth's ecology, to the life form known as Gaia. It's going to take all of us going. End quote. Note. The question of whether the voluntary human extinction movement is a satirical or sincere expression of anti-humanist views is debatable. The subtitle for their manifesto is A Modest Proposal, a clear allusion to Swift's famous pamphlet which satirically proposed eating babies as a means of relieving Irish famine. However, whether they are exaggerating Malthusian rhetoric as a means to expose its callous insanity, or whether they are sincere, 
the fact that so many take it seriously reflects a troubling state of affairs within the ecology movement. End note. According to the saddening reasoning of VHEM, humans are so flawed as a species, so inherently carnivorous and unrestrainable they will inevitably devour the planet. The only way to address this earth's trainable nature is for an ambiguous us to phase out humanity. At the even more extreme end of the movement stand blatantly reactionary groups that advocate authoritarian measures to eradicate humanity itself. The Gaia Liberation Front, GLF, asserts that all life on planet Earth is more important than the survival of the human race. Note. Gaia Liberation Front. Website http slash slash www.paranoia.com slash co slash end note according to their 1997 mission statement the total liberation of earth can only be accomplished through the extinction of the humans as a species note ebitum end note yet unlike the vhem the glf endorses involuntary genocidal tactics including involuntary mass sterilization as well as the release of anti-human viruses such as the airborne version of aids according to his spokes organism geophilus whose writings can be found in their web homepage authoritarian tactics are the only option for restoring ecological integrity quote the evidence is overwhelming that the humans are programmed to kill the earth this programming is not only cultural but probably also genetic since the major technologies, humans use for this purpose from agriculture and metallurgy to writing and mathematics, have all been invented independently more than once. In any case human now carries the seeds of terracide. If any humans survive, they may start the whole thing over again. Our policy is to take no chances. Note. Ebitum and note. What makes this expression of ecology particularly troubling is its appeal to the concept of an innately flawed human nature that must be cast in toto out of the garden. Unlike other reactionary tendencies which blame particular social groups or technology for ecological injustice, longing for a pre-fall industrial era, this group sees no possible return or salvation for any sector within humanity. Invoking scientistic language deployed by Nazis, terms which describe humans as vermin, or as an alien species genetically programmed to kill Earth, the GLF attempts to legitimize its claims by assuming the authoritative voice of the human technocrats they so condemn. Of course most ecologically minded peoples do not present such extreme dictums for self-constraint. Pleas for total reproductive restraint stands in sharp contrast to Stonyfield's reasonable request for individuals to turn off lights when leaving a room. Yet a common theme pervades the thinking of such romantics for whom true love can only be demonstrated by constraining the desire to defile nature. According to the romantic, the betrayal of nature results from a refusal of individuals to restrain themselves by failing to curb the tendency to consume, reproduce, pollute, and waste inherently scarce resources. However, we must ask ourselves, is environmental degradation a mere betrayal of nature caused by the failure of individual self-constraint? Or is this degradation caused by a system of social institutions which allow a privileged few to denigrate and betray most of humanity and the rest of the natural world? The environmental call for individual self-constraint implies a pessimistic view of society's potential relationship with nature. It suggests that our relationship with the natural world is inherently predicated on a repression of an inherent desire to destroy rather than to enhance, natural processes. The idea of love as self-constraint reduces the idea of love to a holding back, or to a repression of a destructive desire rather than as an articulation of a social desire to participate creatively in natural and social processes. Thus we fail to see that we can actually cultivate new desires to create a just society where there would be neither helpless ladies nor helpless mother natures to protect. Privileging the idea of self-constraint obscures the idea of society's potential for rational ecological self-expression necessary for creating a world free of social and ecological denigration. Romantic Concealment, Revealing the Nothingness of the Banana While allowing people to lighten their anxiety about ecological problems, consumer ecology is predicated on romantic concealment. Just as the knight's idealization of his lady conceals his underlying desire to maintain his own social privilege, the idealization of pure commodities conceals consumers, often unconscious, 
desires to maintain their own privilege within a global capitalist economy. The mythology of a pure commodity based on consumer and producer protection and constraint conceals the deeper reality of a grotesquely immoral economic system which is sucking the very life out of the planet, along with over 90% of its inhabitants. Puritanical consumers who can afford to buy costly ecologically friendly commodities can retreat into the discrete world of consumer heaven, where they are absolved of the sin of impure consumption. Focusing on the content of consumption allows consumers to remain within the kingdom of consumer heaven without looking down to see the very hell that capitalist production makes of the earth. Carol Adams explores a similar problem of concealment in her book, The Sexual Politics of Meat, A Feminist, Vegetarian Critical Theory. Note. Carol J. Adams, The Sexual Politics of Meat, New York, Continuum, 1991. P. 175. End note. In this work, Adams describes the concealment of the grim realities of the meat industry within capitalist patriarchy. Adams describes this concealment as the fabricated nothingness of meat, a popular perception shared by most consumers of factory farmed meat products. According to Adams, vital to an ecological ethics is a challenge to the fabricated belief that meat is nothing. Quote. Awareness of the constructed nothingness of meat arises because one sees that it came from something, or rather someone, and it has been made into a no-thing, no-body. In experiencing the nothingness of meat, one realizes that one is not eating food but dead bodies. End quote. Note. E. Beatum, P. 175. End note. Adams calls feminists and all meat-eaters to challenge the idea that meat is nothing to reveal the cruelty and immorality of factory farming and of meat-eating in general. As we deepen our social analysis of production practices in general, we see that the idea of the nothingness of meat may be extended to reveal the nothingness of commodities in general. Just as meat-eaters often fail to appreciate the subjectivity of animals that are plundered by factory farming, consumers in general fail to recognize the subjectivity of the people who are exploited in the production of commodities in general. For instance, while people are often unaware of the suffering of the factory farmed calf when they buy a plastic covered slab of veal, they are often unaware of the struggle of women workers in a multinational textile industry that produce the very shirts on their backs. In addition, when we consider the social and ecological devastation caused by agribusiness, we see that the consumption of vegetable products is often as immoral as the consumption of animal products. For instance, a banana is not always a more moral food choice than a chicken. If we look at the social and economic relationships that transform bananas and chickens into commodities, we often uncover a far more complex set of social problems which determine whether the chicken or the banana represents a more moral food choice. When we reveal the social context of banana production, we are confronted by a moral paradox, while the content of the banana, a form of non-sentient plant life, may represent a moral food choice, the social relations surrounding the agricultural production of a factory farmed banana, may render such a food choice immoral. When we reveal the nothingness of a banana, we become aware of the truly lethal social and ecological realities that deliver the banana from the third world to the first. Most bananas sold in the first world constitute a cash crop which many third world countries export in order to repay their debt to the World Bank or to the International Monetary Fund. These crops are cultivated on soil which could be used for the cultivation of food for the local community itself. Consequently people across the third world literally starve while their land is controlled and converted to export zones for cash crops such as fruits, vegetables, sugar, tobacco, coffee, and timber. Agricultural workers are paid slave wages, denied health benefits, and are exposed to pesticides, herbicides, and chemical fertilizers. Bananas are one of the most pesticide toxic fruits. Note. For a closer look at issues of workers' health and safety related to third world labor conditions, see Women in Development, a resource guide for organization and action. Philadelphia, New Society Publishers, 1984. Also, for a broader discussion of the implications of third world development women's labor, see Jita Sen and Karen Grohn, Development, Crises, and Alternative Visions, Third World Women's Perspectives, New York, 
Monthly Review Press, 1987. End note. Certainly the agricultural worker, who is poisoned with overwork and chemical inputs, whose indigenous land was first confiscated by colonialists, then repossessed by the World Bank, should be given the moral consideration that many vegetarians would give to the chicken. Yet it is often easier to reveal the nothingness of meat than to reveal the nothingness of workers or the nothingness of cultures that are degraded by producing bananas. As we recognize the complex and contradictory nature of capitalist production, it becomes clear why activism regarding the unethical consumption of meat often exceeds activism regarding the unethical consumption of commodities in general. While animals have been reduced to a specific commodity that we may eliminate from our diet, commodities in general thoroughly permeate our social world. It would be impossible to expel each one from our daily lives. The fact is, within a global capitalist system, we are largely unable to determine the modes and ethics of production. It is understandable then, that many of us focus on areas of consumption, such as diet, over which we feel we can exercise some control, however, the longer we focus on the ethics of consumption, as if we could consume morally within a capitalist system, the longer before we reveal the inherent immorality of the capitalist system itself. The desire for nature, the desire for ethical organic practices such as food production, must be broadened and deepened to include as well, a desire for social and political freedom. The desire to spare animals from disrespectful and harmful practices must be elaborated to include an overall challenge to a capitalist system that threatens the very survival of people. Once we reveal the nothingness of the commodity overcoming what Marx called commodity fetishism, we will recognize that each commodity as Adams says, came from something, or rather someone, and it has been made into a no-thing, no-body. Note. Adams, The Sexual Politics of Meat, p. 175. End note. In recognizing the fabricated nothingness of the commodity we realize that we are not merely consuming abstract commodities but that we are devastating actual people's lives, land, and cultures. Ultimately it becomes immoral to separate contents of consumption from forms of production, for in so doing, we turn our heads from the social, ecological, and political costs of global capitalism itself. The Romance of Techno-Dragons, The Fight to Slay Technology Accompanying the struggle for pure commodities, has emerged the struggle for pure technologies. Despondent about the degradation of ecological and social life, people look to the most obvious visible tropes of modern and postmodern society, technology itself. Noting the historical correlation between advanced technologies and the reduction in quality of life, people create causal connections between technology as a general category and ecological injustice in particular. In search of solutions, many look longingly to a past golden age where low technologies did not plunder the Earth's riches, a time before the dragon of modem technology bore its mechanized and treacherous claws, destroying all that it encountered. Yet today's romantic discussions concerning modern technology really reflect crises concerning capitalism and democracy, crises in which citizens are deprived of political forms in which to shape the forms and functions of capital-driven technologies. All around us, we see new technologies sprout up within Newsweek or on the nightly news. Yet we play no direct political role in determining what effect they shall have upon our social and ecological lives. The technologies which most concern us tend to be referred to as high or industrial technologies, technologies whose deployment requires intensive degrees of centralized capital or labor, often at the expense of both social and ecological integrity. Hence, computer, nuclear, communications and biotechnologies, represent sources of tremendous concern for those concerned with social and ecological justice. However, when we remove such discussions from their calls to go back to earlier, easier times and places, we see a different set of problems and opportunities emerge. By exploring the social and political context of these high technologies, we see that they are after all, capitalist commodities produced by corporations, regulated by the state, and often originally researched and developed by the military. So often, backward-looking discussions portray technology as a universal event that emerges within a social and political vacuum. 
We live in an era of technological determinism in which we are told that technology exists as an autonomous force which determines social and political events. Today we become familiar with ideas of technical determinism in journalistic stories which speak of technology out of control, or computers transforming the world exemplified by the opening of this Newsweek article. Quote. The, computer, revolution has only just begun, but already it's starting to overwhelm us. It's outstripping our capacity to cope, antiquating our laws, transforming our mores reshuffling our economy reordering our priorities redefining our workplaces and making us sit for long periods in front of computer screens. Everything from media to medicine, from data to dating has been radically transformed by a tool invented barely 50 years ago. It's the Big Bang of our time. End quote. Note. Stephen Levy Technomania, The Hype and the Hope, in Newsweek February 27, 1995, p3. End note. Such narratives present the idea of technology as a self-driven force within humanity which can shape or level a social world with the same power as a giant meteor. For the technological determinist, it is not economic or political institutions which reshape our practices of media medicine economy law and morality, it is the autonomous and unstoppable advance of technology which demands that we either get wired or get wasted. By regarding technology as a general human force or a universal dragon, we fail to locate specific institutions which design, finance, and deploy harmful technological practices. Too often, no one is to blame when a technology goes wrong. Instead, each ecological disaster is portrayed as a case of technology out of control. Or, worse when we do identify individuals or institutions as accountable for disaster, our analysis often remains too narrow, when the Exxon Valdez spilled its lethal tons of oil, the drunk driver of the oil rig was identified as the guilty party rather than the broader institutions of capital and state apparatuses which stress and regulate workers and natural processes for profit. When we blame technology in general, not only do we fail to identify corporations who financed the technology but we fail to identify the state who granted the patent, and subsidized the corporation excluding citizens from the decision-making process. The truth is, talking about technology is often an excuse for not talking about institutionalized power. It is often an excuse for not talking about the specific ways that institutions such as corporations and the state collude in shaping technologies that are socially and ecologically unjust. It is an excuse for not talking about the lack of real democracy. And what do we gain by talking about technology instead of talking about capitalism and the state? We comfort ourselves with the romantic illusion of being institutionally oppositional when in fact, we actually support capitalism by providing new opportunities for corporations to diversify their markets by creating soft, low-impact, and environmental-friendly technological alternatives for the rich which exist alongside of the really dangerous ones. We cannot fight social institutions merely by critiquing social mediums, or the material expressions of culture. Just as art and language represent social mediums, technology is a social medium that represents a cultural practice of techniques or a prosthetic engagement with the world. Social mediums such as art, language, and technology are often determined by social institutions such as the state, capitalism, or patriarchy. For example today while corporations, the state, and universities determine much of what will be considered high art, they also determine what will be considered high technology. Although there exist popular grassroots artists and technicians who maintain degrees of autonomy from large hierarchical institutions, their cultural practices impact far less dramatically upon society than those subsidized by powerful institutions. In France, Language is actually controlled by the patriarchal state which manages and sustains not only highly gendered linguistic standards, but the incorporation of foreign language and food as well. However, while it is wrong for the state, corporations, or universities to autocratically determine any aspect of social media, we cannot abolish authoritarian institutions merely by protesting against language, art, or technology per se attempts to upgrade social media by creating for instance a feminine language, a people's art, or a low technology, fail to eradicate the source of control of social media. 
whereas we may create the alternative of a feminine language, there will still exist patriarchy and the state which oppress women. Similarly while we may create a people's art or a low technology we will still be confronted by a state, a corporate edifice, and an educational system which controls our lives and destroys the earth in a vast array of other dangerous ways. Finally proposing low technologies, while opening up potentially thoughtful dialogue regarding the ethics of technology does little to oblige people to consider the political and economic conditions which allow corporations and governments to autocratically create social and ecological injustice in the first place. What is more, the lowness of a technology does not determine the justness of its social application. Despite romantic dreams of the inherent goodness of technologies of the past, there exists much in our technological history that is to be desired. As Bookchin points out, while the pyramids in Egypt were built by slaves using very low technologies, early American settlers clear-cut miles of native forest merely by burning and felling, as opposed to using the high-tech chain saws of today. Note. Murray Bookchin. Lecture. Institute for Social Ecology. July 11, 1995. End note. Furthermore, before implementing the higher and more efficient modern technologies of mega gas chambers, Hitler was quite effective in using simple bread trucks and exhaust hoses to round up and asphyxiate entire villages of Jews, before advancing to gas chambers. Clearly we could not say that technological advance was the determining factor for the death of six million Jews. Rather, it was a set of social relationships that allowed for the horrific collusion between a fascist state, a racist ideology a legacy of anti-Semitism, and an entrepreneurial factor, giving way to genocidal devastation. We must consider the absurdity of fighters in the Polish resistance protesting the Holocaust on the basis of objections to the high technology of gas chambers alone. Low technologies that are supposedly fulfilling a benign function, are not always liberatory on a social level. Along the coast of Northern California, stretch miles of gargantuan windmills, while representing a low technology these monstrosities also represent the state's techno-fix to the problem of doling out energy in a centralized and bureaucratic fashion, blotting out the glittering seashore along the way. Similarly the enormous solar collectors in the southwest represent a low technology of preposterous proportion. Rather than promote local and direct expression of technological ethics, such large-scale technologies promote instead the centralized power of the state and corporations who engineer and execute the design of their own choosing. It is indeed crucial that our technological practices do not degrade natural processes. Yet it is also necessary that we do not harm the social world by usurping community self-determination. There is no recipe for a good or ecological technology independent of a truly democratic context. So, we might ask, if technology is not deterministic, if it is informed by particular social relationships, is it in fact simply neutral? Are technologies blank slates to be written upon by those in power? Nothing could be farther from the truth. While there are many technologies, such as a knife, which contain a wide spectrum of potential functions, good and bad, there are many technologies which by their very design are loaded in positive or dangerous ways. Note. Arturo Escobar. Lecture. University of Massachusetts. March 8, 1995. End note. For instance, a nuclear bomb is structurally biased by its design and function to kill inordinate amounts of people quickly or to peacefully intimidate political leaders into submission. However, while we might say that a nuclear bomb is not neutral we could not say that the technology of nuclear bombs alone determined the events in Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Although the nuclear bomb represented a necessary condition for the nuclear bombing of Japan, it did not constitute a sufficient condition. The sufficient condition was comprised of a set of social relationships, a hideous amalgam of foreign policy and a technological expression of that highly undemocratic and capital-driven system called nuclear technology. Given enough time, money, and undemocratic power to develop technology, those in authority can dream up some pretty lethal inventions. Similarly organic fertilizer is structurally biased in a clear direction, albeit a positive one. It is constituted by the very intention underlying its design to enhance, rather than deplete, 
the composition of soil and water. However, while we might say that the technology of organic fertilizer is not neutral, we could not say that the technology of organic fertilizer will actually determine that the world's soil and water will be enhanced. Rather, it is a set of social relationships that determines the scale by which agricultural workers will be able to apply organic fertilizer, as well as whether the soil and water will be too damaged by previous chemical abuse. Hence, whereas organic fertilizer represents a necessary condition for an ethical and ecological agriculture, it alone represents an insufficient condition. The sufficient condition for a liberatory organic agriculture is a social and politically just context the reconstruction of political and social institutions which not only ecologize, but democratize agricultural practice. The Techno-Fix, Slaying the Techno-Dragon At this juncture we might ask ourselves, why are there so few discussions which explore questions of institutional power in regards to technology in the ecology movement? Why have ecological discussions of technology tended toward romantic dreams of slaying dragons of modern technology? Why would so many in the ecology movement prefer to critique the universal category of technology in general as a social medium, rather than critique the political and economic social relations which engender particular technological practices? Note. For a wider discussion of the relationship between technology and democracy see Richard E. Sclove, Democracy and Technology, New York, The Guilford Press, 1995. Although Sclove's book explores the democratization of technology within the context of a representative status democracy he does pose a series of crucial questions concerning the lack of technological democracy within the present context. Also see Bookchin's discussion of the social and political implications of technology in re-enchanting humanity, London, Castle 1995. Pages 148 to 172. End note. Many of us who grew up in post-Cold War America have little consciousness of a revolutionary tradition. Few are aware that there existed a time before the state or capitalism. We accept these hegemonic institutions as inevitable irreplaceable and taken for granted. Therefore, when we are moved to critique society we focus on questions of social mediums we believe we can change, rather than on social or political relationships and institutions which we see as universal and insurmountable. Romantic yearnings for low technologies tend to lead to some pretty ironic outcomes. A few years back, Neo-Luddite Kirkpatrick Sale enacted his anger at technology by smashing a computer on stage at New York's Town Hall. Now surely Sale knows as he takes a hammer to the machine that the computer possesses no autonomous institutional social power. He knows that the computer is neither neutral nor technologically determined, but that it represents a social medium, a social technological expression of the institutions of the military, the state, and corporations such as IBM or Microsoft. By smashing the computer in the social forum of New York City's town hall in Manhattan, Sale tells us that he wishes his critique to be social if not explicitly public. Yet Sale belongs to no municipal political forum in which his position regarding the goodness or badness of computer technology has any authentic political power. Rather than express his voice politically Sale's voice is rendered spectacular as the glossy, computer-enhanced photograph of him heroically slaying the computer on a page of Wired magazine, a computer user's publication. If Sale were to think socially and politically rather than romantically, about the computer he smashes, he might think about how, while it might feel cathartic to smash the computer, there might be still more oppositional ways in which to express his sentiments regarding computer technology. Note. Kevin Kelly, Interview with the Luddite, in Wired. 3.06 June 1995, p. 166. In his Wired interview, Sale comments on the personal satisfaction he gleaned from smashing the computer, it was astonishing how good it made me feel. I cannot explain it to you. I was on stage of New York City's town hall with an audience of 1,500 people. I was behind a lectern, and in front of the lectern was this computer. And I gave a very short, minute and a half description of what was wrong with the technosphere, how it was destroying the biosphere. 
And then I walked over and I got this very powerful sledgehammer and smashed the screen with one blow and smashed the keyboard with another blow. It felt wonderful. The sound it made, the spewing of the undoubtedly poisonous insides into the spotlight, the dust that hung in the air, some in the audience applauded. I bowed and returned to my chair. End note. Rather than smash the computer with a sledgehammer, were sailed to critique the lack of economic democracy surrounding the computer industry he might have considered the fact that only privileged people gain access to computers, such as those working at the press which publishes his books. Instead, Sale might have thought to perhaps share his computer, for instance, with a community center some 40 blocks down in the Lower East Side, called Charis, where radical activists in the Puerto Rican community are engaged in oppositional work for social, ecological, and political change. Activists at a non-profit organization like Charis, who may not be able to afford a costly computer, might be able to use the machine to publish a newsletter for the activist community or might use it for some other activist project. After giving his computer to activists at Charis, Sale could have then joined his neighborhood association where he could have engaged in a political debate regarding the social and ecological ethics of computerization while discussing too, the need for direct democracy. He could have discussed the need for political forums in which we all may participate in making decisions regarding an even broader spectrum of social and technological issues. Rather than point his weapon at the dragon of technology industrial society or mass society he could have discussed how computer technology is driven by an undemocratic global capitalist economy. Moreover, he could have assisted others in understanding how capitalism in general dehumanizes people and destroys the rest of the natural world. In short, if Kirkpatrick Sale were to talk about social relationships rather than generalized social media such as technology, he would talk about computers in the context of such institutions as the state, capitalism, racism, and sexism. However, were he to take such a position, would he have ended up being featured in Wired magazine? Each of us must ask ourselves such difficult questions as we enter discussions concerning technology or any social medium, for that matter. We need to constantly ask ourselves, are there necessary pieces of the picture that we leave out, and why? The fact is, we can often glean more support for critiquing a social medium such as technology, or for slaying vaporous dragons such as mass society or industrialism, than for attempting to abolish and transcend social institutions such as the state or capitalism. We must extend our critique beyond social mediums because social institutions exist prior to and independent of such mediums. For example while merchant and rural factory capitalism emerged as a dehumanizing system prior to the emergence of industrial capitalism, the state preceded the emergence of capitalism itself. The desire to eliminate high technology therefore, is not just insufficient for creating a free and ecological society, it also shifts the focus from the real problem of undemocratic, dehumanizing, and anti-ecological social institutions. And so the question remains, just because we have no direct democratic control over our economies or state, and thus over technological practice, do we cease to critique technologies which we esteem to be socially and ecologically dangerous? Are we obliged to choose between a critique of technology per se and a critique of the state or capitalism? Clearly the answer to these questions is no on both counts. Questions concerning technology may allow us to broaden our thinking about the lack of political and economic democracy surrounding particular technological practices. We can explore the specific harms of particular technologies, calling for social and political action, while broadening our understanding of the political and economic context in which we have little control over capitalist and state practice. In this way, each specific issue concerning technology provides a forum to speak generally about the need for economic and political democracy. Each time we talk about a specific technology or about technology in general, without discussing the urgent need for political democracy we miss a vital opportunity to raise consciousness regarding the broader context of social or ecological change. For the love of nature, knowing self, knowing other. In love, there is a paradox. In order to know and understand that which we love, we must first know ourselves. We must engage in a continual process of becoming conscious of our own beliefs, prejudices, 
and desires if we are to truly see that which we love. When we fail to know ourselves in this way, the beloved can be nothing more than a projection of our own desires a projection that obstructs our vision of the desire's history, and distinctiveness of those we love. In order to truly love nature, society must know itself, it must understand its own social, political, and economic structure, understanding in turn how each individual benefits or suffers from such structures. Yet instead of knowing society many in the ecology movement tend to focus exclusively on an idea of nature that has become the small blue pool into which Narcissus gazed, enamored by his own reflection. Wrapped with his own image, Narcissus saw neither the color of the water, nor did he feel its coolness against his fingers. In the same way, when the privileged look into the pool of nature, they too, cannot see what grows there. They cannot see nature as a contested political and social ground whose abundance and scarcity are unevenly distributed. Instead they see only the romantic reflection of their desire to preserve the institutions and ideologies that grant them access to both social and ecological privileges, they see only the image of Mother Earth as a nurturing victim in need of their protection and control. The practice of authentically knowing nature is one of politicized critical self-consciousness. As social creatures we look at the world through social eyes. In order to see nature, we must be increasingly conscious of how our understandings of nature are shaped by historical institutions such as Christianity, capitalism, racism and patriarchy which give rise to contradictory yet persistent notions of nature as pure, greedy, competitive, dark, passive, and nurturing. For instance, if we are not conscious of the social-religious causes of our own social guilt and self-hatred, we will romanticize nature as a pure and superior being before which we feel puny humbled, and wretched. In the same way, if we do not transcend internalized capitalism, a hegemonic acceptance of capitalism as normative, inevitable and progressive, we will continue to portray nature as a social Darwinian nightmare, a romantic drama in which only the strongest knights, or those best able to make a buck, can survive. In this shameful narrative, the privileged turn their backs on the poor majority who carry both the brunt of and the blame for ecological injustices. In contrast, a radical love of nature entails that we become aware of the history of ideas of nature in addition to politically resisting social hierarchies that nurture distorted understandings and practices of nature as well. In particular, we must extend this critical self-consciousness to our poetic and visual expressions of our desire for nature. We must be critical of our use of metaphors and images of natural processes, making sure that they do not reproduce racist or sexist cultural stereotypes. While there are indigenous cultures that appeal to non-sexist female images of nature, when members of non-indigenous cultures attempt to deploy Mother Earth metaphors, something vital is lost in the translation. Indeed. A metaphor which emerges within the language of an indigenous people cannot always be translated into the language of a culture that emerged in an era of modern and postmodern capitalism. Audrey Lard points to a similar linguistic difficulty when discussing the slave who uses the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. Note. Audrey Lord, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house in Sister Outsider, New York, Crossing Press, 1984 pages 110 to 113. End note. This has been an ongoing struggle especially for eco-feminists relying upon patriarchal language and philosophical constructs to critique and reconstruct patriarchal discourses that relate to ecology. Often, the origin of words and their historical relationship to oppressive ideologies actually contradicts the very spirit of liberation that eco-feminists attempt to convey. Within the current society female metaphors of nature cannot be abstracted from Western patriarchal values, desires, and definitions of women that saturate media, religion, and educational forums. The metaphor of Mother Nature is culturally loaded with masculinist ideologies that justify women's compulsory heterosexuality, motherhood, and subjugation, it contains the history of what it has meant to be both a woman and a mother within this society. Because we are social creatures our understandings of nature will never be pure or free of social meaning or contingencies. Nature is not a thing from which we can separate ourselves and know completely no matter how liberatory our culture or language may be. 
instead of trying to grasp a romantic knowledge of a people less nature through abstract love, protection, and contemplation, we must begin to know and reconstruct the social and political institutions that determine both social and ecological practices. By engaging in a lifelong process of politicized critical self-reflection and action, we may become a society conscious of the historical origins of its own desire for nature, a socialized desire that begs to be developed in a truly radical direction.